Okay, I think I'm going to open the webinar uh, because I know there's quite a couple of questions that we've got to uh, go through. So good afternoon to all our attendees and to all our panelists from DJA Aviation. A very warm welcome to everyone joining us for this very interesting panel discussion sponsored by DJA Aviation. Everything you always wanted to know about aviation insurance, but you were too afraid to ask. My name is Annelie Reynolds and I'm the show director for Aero South Africa. Today's session will be an interactive and informative panel discussion. When you registered for the session, we asked you for your burning questions about aviation insurance and if you wanted to know questions and get answers about how it actually works. The team from DJA Aviation will be answering some of these questions and we'll also encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A box if you have any other questions around aviation insurance. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for the session, Graham Speller, one of the directors at DJA Aviation. Graham is well known in the aviation insurance industry. He has been a specialist in this field for more than 48 years and definitely a veteran in, in his field. He started his career as an aviation insurance broker in London, where he worked in the Lloyds market for Willis Faber Dumas Limited. After immigrating to South Africa in 1976, he joined DJA in 1980. Graham specializes in complex accounts and technical aspects, including training. And now, Graham, I'm handing over to you to kick things off, introduce all our panelists and get the discussion going. Thanks very much indeed. Good afternoon, everyone, and, uh, and welcome to our, our webinar. We're very excited about it. Let me just introduce my colleagues on the panel. Uh, firstly, Daryl Fisher, director of DJA and a corporate client advocate. Carol Kass, director of claims. Jackie Nievote is our marketing director. Joanne Herman is a director and senior client advocate. And Verna Kruger is um, our marketing manager. Um, and uh, as Annie has just said, I'm part of the furniture. Um, we've received loads of questions uh, on a variety of topics. We're gonna to get through as many of them as we can in the time available. If your particular question is not addressed, or if you have other questions you'd like to ask, uh, please contact us either through the Q&A or by all means after the webinar, we'll be happy to help. Um, if there are enough questions that we don't get to, maybe we'll ask Aero SA to arrange a second webinar. Um, the intention is that, as the title of this webinar suggests, this is going to be an informal session to answer those questions that you might have wanted to ask for a long time, um, but never had a chance to. Before we start, I'd just like to take this opportunity to offer one or two comments regarding pitfalls to avoid when arranging aviation insurance. Some of these, of course, could apply to any type of insurance, not just aviation. But aviation is a specialist form of insurance and therefore should be arranged with particular care. Firstly, always use an insurance broker, preferably one with specialist aviation knowledge. Secondly, be aware of and ensure that you're happy with the insurers standing behind your insurance coverage. In general terms, an insurance broker is not responsible for the financial well-being of any insurance company. The contract of insurance exists between you as the aircraft owner and the insurer. And after a loss has occurred, it will be too late to discover that you made a poor selection. Remember that buying cheaply to save money is a bit like stopping a clock to save time. Don't compromise on coverage or insurer security in order to reduce your premiums. As a specialist form of insurance, aviation coverage will often need to be arranged in the international insurance market. But be careful and ensure that you're comfortable with the insurer or insurers that you're being offered. If you've never heard of them, there's probably a good reason for that. Finally, Remember, there is no such thing as providing your insurance broker with too much information about your aircraft or its operation. 
Information is key to your broker's ability to secure the best possible coverage and to ensure that your claims are met promptly and without complications. So on that note, on with the discussion. Um, I'm going to be introducing the questions and uh, nominating one of my victims, I mean, one of my colleagues <laughs> to, to answer it. So here we go. So the first question this afternoon comes from Alencia Govender in Durban, who asks, please could you describe the process that follows an aircraft accident from the insurance perspective? And as our director of claims, I'm gonna neatly pass this, sort of, pass this one on to Carol. Well, thank you, Graham. Um, as you've said, this is from an insurance perspective and it's not from the CAA perspective. Um, the insured then will just give us a call, call your broker, just give the full details of the loss um, and then we'll report it to your insurers who in turn will appoint an assessor. It is imperative to get an assessor appointed as soon as possible and they will lead you through the steps that you need to take um, to, to get the claim settled as soon as possible. The assessor will run with the claim um, and he'll send out a checklist with all the information that he requires to send a report to insurers. Um, the information must come back as quickly as possible and as complete as possible. This will ensure that the assessor can then um, send his report off and get the claim agreed as soon as possible. Um, once the claim has been agreed, then the assessor is in, is in the position that he can authorize um, everything that needs to be authorized, or if it's a total loss, then he can send out a release form. Thanks, Carol. That was, uh, that was a very comprehensive and a great start to the afternoon's proceedings. So well done for that. So moving on, question number two comes from Wayne Langford in Rustenburg, who asks, given that an aircraft is maintained according to strict requirements, AMO requirements, if something breaks in the engine, why isn't this covered? And if you don't mind, Wayne, I'm going to deal with that one myself. Um, Standard aircraft insurance policies do not cover internal mechanical breakdown of engines in much the same way as, a, as motor insurance does not. However, damage caused by accidents resulting from that breakdown are very definitely covered. Damage caused to engine, uh, sorry, should I say damage to engines caused by external factors are of course covered. Um, and that would be maybe lightning strike, ingestion of foreign objects, impact, runway debris, and so on and so forth. Uh, fortunately, there is specialist insurance coverage that is available to insure an engine against mechanical breakdown. Uh, but that is not covered as part of a standard aircraft insurance policy. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, moving on. Stephen Sands from Johannesburg asks, if an engine fails, resulting in an emergency landing, is the engine insured if it is not damaged during the landing? Um, I'm gonna ask Carol to deal with that one again, please. Thanks, Graham. In fact, you've answered a lot of that in your previous I, re <laughs> I realize that. <laughs> Um, so the short answer is no, the engine is not covered if it's not damaged. Um, if, um, as, you've, as you stated, there's certain coverages that are applicable to the engine and its external factors, um, whereas engine breakdown is not covered. Um, DJA have two products that do cover um, that coverage for piston and or uh, turbine engines, and that specifically is for mechanical breakdown. Okay, and those, by the way, those two products, one is called Piston Sure, which covers piston engines, and the other is called Turbo Sure, which, um, well, I won't even tell you because you've, I'm sure we will to work that out yourself. Um, Fakula, uh, Bongani Fakula from Benoni asks, does aviation insurance only cover the aircraft or does it also cover the crew on board? And perhaps Jackie, if we could hear from you for the first time. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Graham, for that question. Yes, so generally speaking, the, the crew is covered against third parties and passengers in the same way as an aircraft owner is. So um, the pilot just needs to be very careful here because they are obviously only covered to the extent that the cover has been arranged by the owner. So if you are a pilot that don't own an aircraft 
um, you need to make sure that the way that the insurance has been arranged by the owner obviously would, would, would cover you. Um, you can't just assume that everything's going to be okay in the event of an accident. If an owner has not arranged the proper insurance, then the pilot may not be adequately insured and may be liable for claims without protection. I think uh, that's, a, that's a really important point to bear in mind um, for any pilot who flies an aircraft that he or she does not own. Um, and that is, it's, it's, it's very well worthwhile to spend a little time first uh, beforehand, ask the owner for a copy of the insurance certificate, inspect it, make sure that you are covered to fly the aircraft and that the aircraft is insured for the purpose that you're gonna put it to and where you're gonna fly it. Uh, be sure, as I said earlier on, that you're happy with the insurer because it's this insurance that you are going to rely upon in the event of a loss where you as the pilot become uh, embroiled in a claim by a passenger or a third party. So that's a, that's a, that's a very, very uh, important point, Jackie. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, now, Dominic Cronoval asks a question which I think we have all asked ourselves uh, from time to time, and not, not just in relation to aviation insurance. And that is, how can you safeguard against being crooked by an insurance company? Um, and Joe, perhaps you could have a, have a crack at that one. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, oh, dear, I've got blank. Um, <laughs> So, um, like Graham said in actually his opening statement, um, it's very important to um, firstly um, get the right broker involved. You do need to use a broker because they are um, aware of all the circumstances that go on um, in your policy. Um, you also would need to, especially in aviation, have a specialist broker. Um, and, and reasons for this is because we need a lot of information. So you have to be able to give the information that is required of you in order for us um, to put you in a position where you are comfortable. And one of the main things as well is obviously um, find out what insurance company you are going to be um, placed with because this is very important. And you, know, you need to be placed with a, a rated insurance company um, you need to be able to um, give all the information we require about who operates the aircraft, um, where, it, where the aircraft is operated, what uses you use, who the pilots are, together with all the claims information from the pilots, as well as yourself or who is operating the aircraft. Um, if you have all this information, you are on the road to getting the the better, the better policy. I think what you're really saying is that it's like with anything else, if you're careful about um, how you buy insurance and who you buy it from and who is representing you, there's no reason to, to ever be concerned that you're going to end up on the wrong side of a claim. Um, and, you know, I, I, let me just add, um, there are very, the, there are no dodgy insurers. Um, however, there are insurers who sometimes are presented with claims that simply are not covered, and then they have no choice but to take a, a harsh and uncompromising position. So a lot, of, a lot of the answer is in the way that the insurance is arranged in the first place. Graham, if um, I could just mention something there. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I uh, always remember, because I've been tasked with looking after the insurances for clients, and it sticks in my head like a mantra every time a client wants a quote, and that is uses. What exactly is the aircraft going to be used for? Don't be scared to ask clients. You need to know exactly what it's going to be used for. Who are the pilots? What are their experience? The graphicals, where is this machine going to be operated and placed? Um, and then finally, last record of the insured and pilots and any other uh, additional insured that will have operational control of the aircraft. That information is absolutely vital. And if you get it correct, which in most times <laughs> clients provide the correct information, you are not going to have a problem in the event of a claim. That's a, a good point, Daryl. Yeah, well, well put. Um, 
So Danny Mayer asks a question that I guess um, any aircraft owner um, asks himself um, multiple times. And, and um, if anyone can give me the answer, um, it's, it's going to be Werner, our marketing manager. The question is, how are aviation insurance premiums calculated? Werner? Have a go Thank you for that one. <laughs> Thanks for that, Graham. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, uh, there's a multitude of factors. Avi uh, aviation insurance is still one of those classes of insurance where there is no tariff or a fixed set, a fixed set of terms. Underwriters are given a wide discretion when it comes to setting the terms. So the presentation of the risk is also very important, as is the relationship between the individual broker and also the individual underwriter. We sometimes wonder how insurers calculate the premiums and uh, whether it also has something to do with the weather outside at the time or whether it's a Monday or a Friday. This is always why it's always very important for clients to completely fill out their proposal forms and also to give us much more information surrounding their individual circumstances and also the risk so that we can effectively make underwriters aware of any risk mit mitigation factors as well. I remember many years ago when I was in London, we often used to think that the, the, the rate quoted on a particular risk had something to do with the number of pigeons that were roosting on the underwriter's windowsill at the time, um, because there sometimes didn't seem to be any logic in it at all. Uh, Caroline Cole from Benoni asks, are there any insurance options available for flight instructors? And uh, Jackie, perhaps you could uh, respond to Caroline on that question. Well, um, yes, thank you, Graham. The quick answer to that is yes, um, there is. There is, in fact, there for flight instructors, there's three options of cover that they can take out. The one is a loss of license cover. Um, the other is personal accident insurance. And then there's life cover as well. Just to give a brief understanding of the cover, your loss of license cover is more for your commercial pilots. Um, it is, so it's the benefit is for uh, payable to the instructor or the commercial pilot in the event that they are entirely prevented from acting in the capacity to hold their license. And it's generally um, based on their, on their salary and, and, and calculated on five times the annual salary. The personal accident insurance is, a, is basically cover that not just the commercial pilot, it's any pilot can take out. And it covers the insured for um, bodily injury as a result of an accident. Um, the last one is then the life cover, which we at DJ don't offer. Um, we used to, back in the day, we had a sister company that did it, but we don't officially do it within our company. But there is market for it, and we do have reputable companies out there, which we can suggest. If anyone is interested, they can just give us a call, and we can suggest someone that can assist them with that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jax. So uh, moving on, Chandra Swanapool from Mossel Bay. Good afternoon asks, why is it important for a lower pilot to have insurance? And second part of the same question, does insurance cover only, does insurance cover only a specific type of aircraft, even if it's been hired? Um, and Carol, perhaps you'd like to uh, respond to Chandra on that one. Okay, thank you, Graham. Um, you know, many pilots who hire an aircraft from a friend or from a club will be expected to cover the excess or deductible should there be an accident. Uh, this type of insurance, namely pilot excess, um, will cover you for this. The pilot excess is not limited to any um, specific aircraft, um, no matter who you hire it from, or in fact, if it's your own aircraft. Um, also, um, you can take out fixed wing or rotor wing as well. The rotor wing will cover you for both fixed and rotor, whereas um, the fixed wing cover will just cover you for any type of fixed wing. Um, just, just to make a comment though, um, it covers students if it's a training flight. However, if it is um, an instructor, it wouldn't cover the instructor whilst they're given instruction. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, Carol, whether the fellow in the picture behind you um, stuck up in his tree whether he had pilot excess insurance. I'm not sure whether he would have done it. By the looks of it, he certainly needed it. And I'm loving the way that my colleagues, every time I ask them to answer a question, they all start off by saying, thank you, Graham. When meantime, what they're actually saying is, oh, for God's sake, did you really have to ask me that one? Um, but anyway, <laughs> carrying on. Um, Ant Weaver in Belito asks, uh, he's interested to know what, it was, what 
insurance cover is available for crop spraying pilots in terms of death and disability. And Jackie, I think this sort of carries on from the question that was asked just now, perhaps. So perhaps you could just add to that. Unmute. Are you on mute, Jax? Sorry, I, I thought I unmuted myself and then I put myself back onto mute, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this happens when you press the button twice. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you, Graham. The, yes, so agricultural pilots um, can arrange insurance for death and disability under a personal accident policy or a life assurance. It seems like I'm getting all these pilot ex, um, personal accidents and life assurance ones. <laughs> so yes, there, there is um, there is cover for that. It might take a little bit longer, um, but a specialist broker can um, get you that type of cover, if, whether it be a life assurance advisor. Um, or obviously from our side, we can do the personal accident insurance. So yes, there is definitely there is cover. Okay. Um, now, Nicholas Const Constant Dudakis, I hope I, I hope I pronounce that right, Nicholas. Forgive me if I didn't. Uh, you've asked a question that is actually um, a, a, a little difficult to answer. You've you've said how does the breach of contract clause work? Um, I'm I'm not sure what breach of contract clause you're. Talking, uh, talking about specifically. If you could um, perhaps pop, a, um, pop something into the Q&A um, section and I'll try and come back to it. Um, otherwise, you're, you're more than welcome to give me a call after the webinar and, and we, can, uh, we can figure out what it is you're actually referring to and then I'll be happy to, to answer that question for you. Um, so Ramu Naidu, in fact, there's three questions now, which are virtually, virtually the same. Ramu Naidu from Johannesburg asks how aircraft values are determined for insurance purposes and what depreciation rate, if any, is applied annually. Uh, Shirley Hiller from Bryanston asks, what is the best way to arrive at the insured value for the aircraft you're insuring if you've earned it for a few years? And uh, Anil Chopra from Dar es Salaam, my word, welcome, um, has asked how to determine the sum insured or agreed value for aircraft in African markets where you don't have valuators available. Um, and all of those questions are, are, are very important questions to, to, to consider. Um, the general rule of thumb is that an aircraft should be insured for its current market value at the commencement of the insurance. Given, given a, a certain leeway, um, you can obviously, you can insure for slightly above market value to cater for any future fluctuations. But we're very fortunate in the aviation insurance industry in that we work almost exclusively on the basis of what are known as agreed values, um, as opposed to insured values. Um, if you insure your motor car, for example, you will usually be insured for the current market value at the time of a loss. With an agreed value policy, the value is agreed between you and the insurer at the commencement of the insurance. So regardless of what the uh, market value is at the time of a loss, the value has already been agreed. So the question is, um, how does one go about establishing the agreed value? It's important not to underinsure an aircraft, uh, because that way you could end up with a total loss settlement um, following relatively minor damage, and you end up, if, in effect, selling your aircraft to an insurance company for a, for a price that you wouldn't be happy with. Equally, if you overinsure the aircraft, you give the insurers the opportunity to effect repairs um, which may take a long time, but which would not have been possible if the aircraft had been insured close to its market value. So there are various resources that you could use. Uh, there's a, a document called the Aircraft Blue Book, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. Um, it has limited value because it is really based on the USA market rather than the international market. Um, you could speak to the local distributor for your aircraft type. And they will certainly be able to give you a guidance as to the current value of your particular aircraft, or indeed your AMO, the, the, the company that looks after your aircraft, will probably also be able to give you guidance. Um, however, having a formal appraisal carried out by a 
company that specializes in doing this sort of thing um, every now and again is, is a very good idea. And there are companies uh, available that will do that. And in response to Anil Chopra, let me just uh, also um, assure you that those companies that carry out appraisals, um, they may be based in one country. For example, there's one very good one here in South Africa that we, we often refer our clients to. Um, but they will travel throughout the continent and indeed throughout the world um, doing what they do. So the fact that you may not have local um, qualified valuators does not mean that you would not be able to use their services. They, they do exist. I um, hope that helps. Sean Hensman from Bella Bella asks, why are some, in, why are some engines insured? and others not, i.e. Continentals are, but Rotax engines are not. Um, and Joe, perhaps you would like to respond to Sean on that one. Joe, you're on you're mute. Joe, you're on mute. <laughs> Done it again. Hi, sorry about that. Did you hear the question? I, I did. I was just looking at Jackie, though. She was on the on the screen. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I did. So um, insurers will um, insure aircraft that are fitted with both, both types of engines. However, if we're looking on the mechanical side, um, it's obviously the insurer's choice to what sort of um, policies he puts together. So he may choose um, not to like a particular engine or not to ensure that particular type of engine. And um, that's, that's what happens with some of our, some of our products. Um, some engines are, are looked at favorably and, and some are not. Um, and that's the- So Joe, so you're, you're, you're talking specifically about a, a mechanical breakdown policy. So in other words, an aircraft fitted with a Rotax engine, for example, provided it's, um, it's legal, um, the aircraft itself will certainly be insured while it has that engine fitted. And if that engine is damaged in, in an accident, for example, the insurers will pay for it uh, to be repaired or replaced, no problem at all. But where you have a specific mechanical breakdown policy, um, those insurers tend to be quite particular about the type of engines that they're prepared to insure. And unfortunately, um, at the moment anyway, to, to our knowledge, uh, the Rotax series of engines is, is, not, um, is not insured under those sorts of policies. Thanks, Joe. Um, Walter Dubel from Heidelberg asks, is the, and so, <laughs> So it's a really it's a really good question. I'm I'm not sure. I'm going to ask Daryl to to answer it, and I'm going to be really interested to hear what Daryl has to say. He says, "Is the general aviation insurance risk in South Africa higher than in Europe, the UK, or the USA?" No pressure, Graham. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say that I've answered this uh, a little bit differently. I, I said. I would say that the South African market has always been competitive. The rates have compared favorably with those offered uh, in other parts of the world. As a general comment, the aviation infrastructure in the USA, Europe, and UK is likely to be of a higher standard than many parts of Africa. And consequently, insurers may require higher premiums and additional continue, uh, conditions for continental Africa. I hope that you know make it clear. Whilst our local market is competitive, um, and we all want great rates, the 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 conditions on the African continent, from a risk point of view, are such that the underwriters would want to charge more. Unpaved runways, maybe there are no um, towers, etc. Et Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to jump backwards because uh, Nicholas um, has, in fact, expanded on his question a little earlier about the breach of contract clause. And what he's actually referring to is what we uh, in the aviation insurance industry refer to as breach warranty insurance. 
um, which is a form of um, extended coverage that a bank or financier will often require to be included um, on the insurance policy covering an aircraft, which protects the bank in the event that their debtor, in other words, the owner of the aircraft, uh, breaches the policy conditions to the extent that the insurers would normally be entitled to deny a claim by the insured. So what breach of warranty coverage does is to give the, the bank or financier the comfort of knowing that under those circumstances, if they were unable to recover the full extent of their debt from the insured, they would be able to turn to the insurers um, and claim indem indemnity. Um, it is a fairly contentious issue um, because insurers um, really are not that keen to, to give away all of their rights and have to pay banks, but without it, um, aircraft could not be financed and therefore it is a, it's a fact of life and something that the insurance industry um, has to provide. So Nicholas, I, I, hope that, I hope that was your question and I hope that was the right, uh, the right answer that you were looking for. Um, Andy Coase um, from Alberton asks, what excesses or deductibles as we sometimes refer to them as, apply to typical aircraft insurance following common accidents like a, a bird strike or hangar rash or a hard landing that causes aircraft damage? Um, and Carol, here we go. It's all about the accident and the claim. So over to you. Okay. I'm not going to say thank you again. Um, ex <laughs> excesses or deductibles are set when the insurance is taken out or on renewal each year. Um, it's a fixed amount and it's not a percentage of the claim as you typically see in a, in, in a motor claim. Um, say you have a 172, you would usually have an, a deductible of, say, 20,000 rand. So should you damage the aircraft, whether it's hangar rash that will cost you 5,000 or 25,000 or a total loss of say 1.5 million, um, the deductible stands at 20,000. So it never alters and it is always set at the start of policy. Thank you very and, much. Uh, um, just to say, clients uh, sometimes get uh, confused. They think the percentage of the claim uh, the cost of the claim is the excess, but it is not. It's the value of the aircraft. The percentage of the value of the aircraft is the excess, and that is the amount that is payable uh, in the event of a loss. But if I was an aircraft owner and I was presented with a with insurance with a you know a twenty as Carol has just said a twenty thousand rand excess or a fifty thousand rand excess. Um, I certainly couldn't afford that. So what would my options be? To take out deductible insurance. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and that, that ensures the excess or the deductible down to mm -hmm. a level that I, I could choose, I guess. Correct. Yes. Depending on what it is, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Jackie. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Uh, here's one from Athel France, and I'm, I am assuming that it's the Athel France we all know and love. Good afternoon, Athel, if it is you. Well, good afternoon, Athel, even if it isn't you. Um, who asks, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the South African aviation insurance industry over the past 18 months? Um, and Daryl, I'm going to bounce that one straight on to you, if you don't mind. Thank you, Graham. I say that aircraft have generally remained operational, albeit at a lower frequency, um, but the need for insurance has always remained important over this time. Assets are expensive. Risk profiles have changed due to um, changing requirements. For example, passenger charter flights, which were happening frequently prior to the pandemic, uh, may now have slowed down, but um, in their place, additional work has, has come to, to the fore. I'm thinking of um, aerial ambulance and the transport of cargo. So whilst the pandemic certainly has had an impact, uh, aircraft owners have also found alternative work for their aircraft where some areas have dried up. 
thank you. Athel, I hope that answers uh, answered that very good question. So Peter Crenier from Cape Town um, asks, why do operators that show safety initiatives such as uh, SMS, FDM, uh, FOQA, et cetera, not benefit from lower insurance premiums like other industries? And uh, Peter, if you don't mind, I'll, 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 have, a, I'll have a crack at that one myself. Um, so flight operations, quality assurance, and flight data monitoring um, are, are usually synonymous. Every operator, every commercial operator has or should have a safety management system in place to mitigate risk to acceptable levels. But when we refer to an aviation safety management system, commonly called SMS, we refer, we refer to the formal processes and methodolo methodologies to manage safety, usually based on ICAO standards or recommendations. Depending on the type of operation, insurers will have an expectation as to the type and extent of the applicable safety management uh, system being followed, whether informal or informal. It's up to the insurance broker to present the risk to the insurers, uh, highlighting the safety management program followed by the operator and to ensure that credit is, due, uh, is given when, when due. But there is no automatic discount that is applied. Each and every case is judged entirely on its own merits, as Werner referred to earlier on uh, regarding the question about how is insurance premium determined. It is very much a, um, a, a subjective uh, issue um, for individual insurers to determine. And it's our job as insurance brokers to present the risk in the best possible light. Um, and Stacia Kutu of Pretoria asks, like there's a road accident fund, uh, is there such a thing as an air accident fund? And is there such a thing as pilot life cover or just accident insurance? Well, I think the second part of that has already been ans answered a couple of times, but I am going to ask Jackie to just um, discuss the first part of that question. Thank you, Anastasia. I won't thank you for that question, Graham. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, so, yes. Um, I'm, a quick I'm, lo to that. I'm loving this, by the way. I'm absolutely <laughs> loving it. No, um, there is no such cover as an accident or um, an air um, accident fund. Um, it's the responsibility of arranging the insurance for any physical damage to an aircraft, including the liabilities to passengers and third parties, is mainly um, upon the, the owner of the aircraft to arrange. So I guess for any pilots flying someone else's aircraft, or even if you're a passenger on someone's aircraft, it's not a bad idea to ask for a copy of the insurance to see how it is arranged and if, if what is the cover, to what extent you are covered in terms of that policy. And then yes, um, pilots obviously can take out cover for themselves for their flying activities and so on under a personal accident policy again. So if you as a pilot is wor are worried for your family and whether there is going to be some sort of cover for you, then I would suggest to take out personal accident. It's, it's individual insurance. I think the, um, I think a, a, a point perhaps to bear in mind, Jackie, is that, um, and fortunately, thank goodness, there isn't an air accident fund because it would probably be as bankrupt as the road accident fund is. Um, <laughs> True. But the, the important thing is that the selection of the amount of insurance, the selection of the sum insured is, is entirely up to the aircraft owner or operator. Yeah. There are some minimum requirements laid down um, in the, in the uh, domestic and international air service regulations in South Africa, um, where operators, commercial operators are required to carry a minimum level of liability insurance. But those limits were set 30 plus years ago, when even Dennis Janklow was a young man. Um, if you have any idea of how long ago that must have been. Um, <laughs> and I'm saying that, by the way, because I can see that he's posted a question on the Q&A, so but I, I, know he's, I know he's listening in. Um, but so those limits were set many, many years ago. And there is a, um, uh, an occasional misconception that if you insure for the limits, the, the, the prescribed limits, that somehow that is enough and nothing could be further from the truth. So the amount of insurance, so the amount of cover is entirely dependent on the uh, limits selected by the aircraft owner. And it is an area that um, all aircraft owners and operators need to be 
very, very careful about and give serious consideration to. Um, Frank Smook in uh, Centurion, particularly given the pandemic over the last 18 months, he says, altered between ground cover and flying cover each year. And Joanne, perhaps you could, um, you could answer that one for Frank. Sure. Um, the policies are usually taken or, or, or that we offer are annual policies. And therefore, at the beginning of the policy period, um, we actually find out the information of what you are using the aircraft for, um, how many hours you will be flying, um, and, and generally um, the insurers take that into account as well as the fact that there will be maintenance involved um, and that sort of thing. So when the rates are um, calculated, um, all that is taken into, into effect that they only expect you, especially on the smaller aircraft, they only expect you to, to fly so many hours a year. So my answer therefore would be no, they will not be going from um, full flight to ground. Um, what we can do is usually on renewal, if we know that the aircraft is going in for maintenance or repair for the first couple of months on the policy, then we can put the policy in on ground risk. And then during the course of the year, once the aircraft is ready to fly, we can put it on full flight risks. However, um, if there are circumstances, we can, as a broker, always ask the insurer if they would look at your risk individually. Um, but my first answer would be no, it's not something they do. I think, I think that also comes down to the relationship between the broker and the insurer concerned. And there's another reason to always use a broker, because the chances are uh, your insurance broker um, has a relationship with a particular insurer that enables them to negotiate more strongly than you would be able to if you were um, if you were um, dealing directly with an insurer. Um, Michael Port has come up with a with an absolute cracker of a question. I'm going to ask Werner to deal with this. Werner, by the way, is our resident pilot. Um, he's the only one who's got a flying license um, out of the panel. The rest of us are great passengers, um, but he's he's our he's our pilot. So Michael Port asks, is it legal? It's a leading question, hey Werner. So be careful. <laughs> is it legal? <laughs> Is it legal to conduct game capture and culling with a helicopter without radios? And how would insurance be affected in the event of a loss? Yeah, well, um, thanks for the question, Michael. And uh, just to clarify, Graham, it's a lapsed PPL. <laughs> I'm trying to renew it, but there, yes. There, there I was trying to build you up. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Graham, to me, this question seems to relate a lot more to air law and not really insurance. I would suggest that the pilot should be checking the cars or the civil aviation regulations requirements in respect of the minimum equipment list, list for his aircraft. Uh, another thing that he should consult is probably the POH or the pilot's operating handbook for the manufacturer's recommendations. And uh, alternatively, you can possibly have it approved in writing by the DCA. Um, or the Director of Civil Aviation, and the best way probably to deal with the insurance is to get prior authorization from your insurer. I really think that this would be the best course of action to take. Um, I think it's prudent to remember that insurers, insurance will always follow the law. If it is legal, it might be covered, but if it's illegal, it will definitely not be covered. And in short, um, don't fly without a radio ever. You might be putting your own life or the life of other people in danger. I think it's a, that's, a, that's a really good answer. And I particularly like the insurance follows the law. I think that's something that uh, every pilot and aircraft owner needs to um, keep very much at the forefront of, of their minds. Um, yeah, I think it's always it's always a thing, you know, we don't make the rules, you know, it's it's not for us to decide if, if it is or isn't. I mean, if it's law, they need to unfortunately follow that. I think I think that, uh, Jackie, I think there's there's always been a, um, a misconception 
um, which I have to say is sometimes put about by the Civil Aviation Authority itself, that somehow the insurance industry are secondary regulators. Um, you know, we've, we've often heard um, of uh, aircraft owners who have asked the Civil Aviation Authority to, to provide a, uh, a waiver for a particular course of conduct, only to be asked, well, what does the insurance say? Um, and the answer to that is, the insurance doesn't say anything at all, until such time as the Civil Aviation Authority has said something. And if the CAA approves it, then the insurance, generally speaking, will, will fall in line, but it will never work the other way around. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good point, Jackie, and, and Werner, well answered, very good. Um, Terence Le Leboaba, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Terence, asks, often than not, the high, the, a high number of aviation accidents fall below an insurance deductible. Why isn't there an insurance for deductibles? Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Jackie to uh, to respond to that. It should be a really short answer, I would think. Wow, yeah. The fact that um, people don't know that yet that there is ex excess insurance. I mean, that is one of our biggest things. I've always, you know, we always encourage people to take out excess insurance. And yes, there most certainly is. In fact, we offer um, three types of, of excess insurance within our company. One being owner's excess and the other deductible buy down, which is pretty much the same the same thing. The one is just for our piston engine aircraft or our single and multi, and the other one is for turbine aircraft. And then the other one is for um, pilot excess. Um, and it's basically a way of ensuring your standard whole excess under your whole policy down to a certain minimum amount. Um, all the coverages have various different um, uh, limits that you can insure it down to, which you can obviously choose from. And um, then we've got the pilot excess. I know um, Carol also mentioned earlier about the pilot excess insurance and, and what it covers. And, you know, there needs to be a valid claim under the whole policy as well. I'm not sure, Joe, if you want to add anything to that, because I know you obviously act um, or you uh, run with that pilot excess policy um, solely on your side, if you want to add something. Thanks, Jackie. No, just, well, just so to say that um, pilot access is for individuals and obviously, um, you know, a lot of individuals don't necessarily fly the same aircraft all the time. Um, so that is why we have the pilot access. It, it covers you on whatever type of aircraft you're flying, depending on the amount you've actually insured. Um, so it will all, always cover up to, up to that amount insured. And um, the pilot excess, where it's a little different from the other two policies, is that you actually can insure it down to nothing. Yeah. So if your excess is 20,000, you can insure it down to zero. Yeah, and in fact, the question the earlier we mentioned that, you know, a pilot should be looking at a client's policy as well. You know, the owner may have well have taken out owner's excess or deductible insurance, which insures it down to a certain minimum, but there may still be a portion that is uninsured. And the owner may turn to you as pilot to say, you need to cough that up, whether it be 25,000 Rand, 2,000 Rand, whatever the case may be. So the pilot excess insurance will still cover you for that amount. And like Joe said, it covers you on any aircraft that you fly, not specifically only, you know, to a specific registration where the owner's excess and deductible insurance is aircraft specific and follows obviously the coverage conditions on the policy. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'd just um, like to clarify. Sorry, Graham. I'd just like to clarify as well, because I have had it. Um, it is there specifically for the whole deductible. Um, it is not there for any third party um, damage that might occur. It is specifically there to, to cover the whole deductible. Thanks, guys. Um, I would just like to um, go quickly to the Q&A because um, there's a question here from Charmaine. Charmaine, sorry, I can't see your surname, so I do apologize. Uh, all I can see is Charmaine, uh, who's asked a really, really good question, uh, which hadn't come up before. So I'd just like to respond to it now. She asks, would you be so kind as to elaborate on what the route would be as SASRIA does not cover aviation risks? Mm -hmm. uh, what would an owner's options be if an aircraft were to be damaged during riots? Now, of course, we've had those dreadful riots in, uh, uh, in KZ in, in particular um, a few months ago, 
Um, and it, it certainly did raise um, concerns about the safety of aircraft at, um, at local, mm -hmm. local airports. Um, SASRIA, for those who don't know, is the South African Special Risks Insurance Association, which is a government-backed uh, insurance uh, company um, that provides um, coverage for uh, political risks, riots, and, and, and such like, but as Charmaine points out, does not cover um, marine or aviation risks. Unfortunately, uh, in the aviation market, we have a specialist form of insurance. We refer to it as um, a aviation hull war risks insurance. Now, of course, we don't really mean war, um, but basically it's a form of, of coverage, it includes war, uh, riot, strike, hijack, confiscation, political risks, um, and uh, malicious damage, acts of sabotage, all of those uh, risks. I suppose you could say it's it covers any loss that is deliberately caused by a third party. Um, and uh, it's, it's a specialist form of insurance. It's freely available, uh, usually written in the, um, in the Lloyd's market um, or by local insurers. Um, and we, for example, will not insure an aeroplane um, unless our clients uh, select both types of coverage. Uh, because the last thing one wants is for a loss to occur when there's some doubt as to whether this was a, uh, a, a, an act of sabotage or maybe an attempted theft. Uh, and depending on what the answer to that would be, uh, would determine which policy would respond. So the good news is, yes, there is specific insurance uh, available, Charmaine, for all of those types of losses. Um, and as you said, because it's called uh, war risks, science uh, is no war. Therefore, uh, we don't want to cover. And you have to explain it, you know, as you have done there. It includes a lot of perils. And there's a lot of political activity going on uh, in the country, in the world. And so to be without the cover, in my view, would be foolhardy. Yeah, good point, Daryl. Yeah, and I completely agree with you. Uh, so two questions which are very similar, uh, one from Rick Martins in Joburg and the other from John Shaw, also in Joburg. Um, both more or less the same question. Um, can DJNA cover uh, kit or experimental aircraft during the build? Uh, what about tools and equipment in the hangar? Uh, what about transportation? to the airfield following, um, following the construction and can proving flights be insured? Um, so Joe, um, as our uh, senior client advocate who deals with a lot of this type, this class of aircraft, I'm gonna ask you to respond to that if you don't mind. Okay, so um, the answer is no during the, during the build. Um, the content oh, contents of the hangar um, that we cannot cover, that you need to go to your commercial um, department for. Um, they, will, they will have a look at the contents of that. Um, as far as the transport, no, that won't be covered either. But you could probably speak to the Marine Department um, who could probably look at um, covering the transportation. And then um, the proving flight. So we can get um, insurance for kit planes, um, as long as they are factory built. So not home built by yourself, etc. It would have to be factory built. Um, and yes, then we can get the proving fl flights covered as well. So the, the news isn't particularly good in that case. Before. Not really, no. no. Okay. Um, are we able to, even if we can't insure the, the aircraft itself, are we able to arrange legal liability cover for um, that class of aircraft? Are there, are there in insurers some, in South Africa that will, that will cover that type of aircraft for liability risks? Most of the time, yes. We have, we have had a few that um, insurers are not are definitely not interested in, and especially um, ultralights, um, definitely won't go near them. 
Um, but yes, there, there's a possibility we can we can have a look at that. And then also, if you're part of the the Aero Club, um, we do do um, third party legal liabilities. Um, for individuals that are part of the Aero Club. Thank you. Um, here's a question from an old friend of ours, um, Alan Evan Haynes. Good afternoon, Alan. Um, Alan asks, what are the factors that affect the pricing of aircraft hull insurance, both positively or negatively? Uh, so, Verna, as our marketing manager, I'll leave that one to you because you have to deal with this every day. <laughs> Thanks, Alan, for your question. Um, aircraft hull insurance is priced on many factors. Um, that includes the type, age, the value of the aircraft, and uh, one might even say the number of aircraft built if you consider the availability of spares as well. Um, the operational envelope, that is to say the purpose of use of the aircraft, the pilot's experience, the geographical area of operation, and also the previous loss record of the owner and the pilots. The effect of these are fairly obvious, I think. Um, newer aircraft with higher values will get lower rates, all, things, uh, all other things being equal, than older versions of the same aircraft with a lower value. Riskier uses will, equal, will, will uh, warrant higher rates. Um, and again, more experienced and current pilots will have lower rates. And operation restricted to the geographical limits of South Africa only will have lower rates than, for example, an aircraft that's flying throughout the whole of Africa. A loss-free record will also give you lower rates than ones with previous losses on, especially if those losses were in the last five years. Uh, but ultimately, it's all about the information and the manner in which the risk is presented to uh, the insurers by your broker. There are no hard and fast rules. Please just give your broker enough information that they uh, are uh, enough information regarding uh, then just the make and model of your aircraft and your pilot hours. Um, the better the insurer can understand your risk, the better the rate is that you will ultimately get. Thanks. Thanks, Werner. Um, Nina, Gardner, Nina Gardner from Bloom asks, I have a PPL, but I don't have much experience yet. What personal insurances do I require to fly? Um, Nina, I'm, I'm going to ask, answer that one if I if I may, because I think it is an important it's an important question. Um, first of all, you don't need any personal insurances in order to fly. You need a flying license and that and a medical, and that's that's about it. However, the question that you've raised is important in the sense that it is vitally it is vital that any pilot um, who is uh, who is starting out. Uh, ensures that their own personal insurances, the insurances that they already have, uh, will cover them while they are flying. Now, I'm talking about, um, obviously, life insurance. You might have a, a, a provident fund through your employer. You might have personal life insurance. You might have personal accident insurance. It is really important that you make those inquiries and, and ensure that whatever insurance you or your family are going to rely on in the event of your untimely demise um, is going to respond, notwithstanding your aviation activities. Um, you know, some, some, um, some insurance companies or life insurance companies are still kind of stuck in the dark ages and they try and restrict uh, coverage for aviation activity to flying as a as a passenger um, in a uh, multi-engined aircraft being operated over scheduled routes. I mean, this is going back to about the 1950s, but there are some that will still adopt that sort of archaic attitude. You've got to be aware, you've got to check, you've got to make sure. Obviously, coming up to, I think, probably the question that you were asking, um, you may uh, buy uh, pilot excess insurance to protect yourself in the event that you become um, liable to pay the insurance deductible on an aircraft that you've borrowed or hired. Um, and uh, you, you, you might want to buy additional personal accident cover if you don't already have it. But to me, the key thing is to ensure that any insurance that you've got uh, caters for your aviation activities. So I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, 
moving on, a couple of questions very similar. I'm going to ask Daryl to, um, to respond to both of them. Uh, Natasha Parry, who's a good friend of ours, and Christoph Andrukowski from Craighaven, um, ask, what are the current market trends locally and internationally uh, in terms of uh, rates, increase or decrease in insurer appetite? And how does the South African insurance and reinsurance market compare international uh, compare to the international market? Um, it's a really complex question, which requires a really complex answer. So there's only one person to answer that, and that's Daryl. You are so kind, Graham. Wow, what can I say? <laughs> Uh, yes, we are currently in a hard market where insurer appetite to take on risk has reduced. Uh, generally, insurers are looking at higher premiums and accepting a reduced percentage of the risk when previously they were able to write 100%, no problem. Um, the local market, I just want to add, whilst they are requiring uh, rate increases, um, they, they generally are not pushing as hard as the overseas insurers in respect of rates. So it is just something to bear in mind. Uh, I have then said that South African insurers um, have been writing aviation insurance for over 50 years. They have the knowledge, experience, and reinsurance protection to handle all claims on the business that they underwrite. All rated insurers have adequate reinsurance programs so that they alone do not need to pay 100% of any claim uh, should it arise, which would, cost, which would really cost them their business. So generally speaking, the smaller, less complex risks would be placed in the local market and larger, more complex risks would be placed in the overseas market. Uh, that is a generalization. We do have a strong local market with an appetite for overseas type business, but that in a nutshell is, is, is how it all fits together. Guys, we're beginning to run out of time. It's just a little after four o'clock. We've got time perhaps for another um, uh, three or four questions. Um, we were just so, having fun now, Graham. Now we have to yeah, stop. Yeah, I realise that. Well, I, I, think, <laughs> I think, I think, I think, it, I think all of the attendees. I think they've already logged off. I think it's only us. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to whistle through a couple um, very quickly, if I may. One which is not specifically related to aviation insurance, but I think it's a, it's a good question anyway. It comes from our old friend Kurt Kronovold. Um, who asks about the, um, about the extent to which technology is being embraced to drive digital platforms and the work process management, saving paper via paperless offices and so on and so forth. And Kurt, what I would say to that is that the, um, the insurance industry um, has been at the forefront of the drive towards um, a paperless environment. Uh, most communication between ourselves and insurers uh, both locally and overseas is is performed electronically is stored electronically um, the lloyd's market overseas has an electronic uh, platform that is now uh, being rolled out to all uh, brokers in the international market to use um, and um, insurance is often completely automated these days um, and and some of us are implored to deal direct with insurers and to cut out the middleman and save costs and so on and so forth. Fortunately, aviation insurance is still very much a person-to-person -person business, as, as Verna has, has commented um, on, a, on several questions um, earlier this afternoon. And, and so we still work very much in a, um, in a, in a personal environment, and it's, it's vitally important for us to maintain that. So whilst the back office functions are largely paperless now and are being uh, placed more and more on, on digital platforms. Fortunately, the actual front end of the business, the dealing with clients, the dealing with insurers is still very much a personal face-to-face -face business and long may that continue. Um, another question which um, I would really like to, to answer because I think it's incredibly important, um, arises from uh, Dion Crady in Hoodspray, 
Now, Dion asks, how does insurance respond where scenic flights are covered without an air service license on the pretext of an introductory flight by a club? Now, I'm assuming, Dion, that, that what you're referring to is where a introductory flight is paid for by the person seeking the introductory flight. So in other words, this would be a flight for reward. Um, and the, the answer, the very simple answer to that is as Werner has pointed out, insurance follows the law. It does not decide the law. Insurers cannot ensure the consequences of illegal conduct, nor are they, as I mentioned earlier, the secondary regulators. So if insurers believe that a, an operation is uh, being conducted, when I say an operation, I mean a, a, the carriage of passengers for reward is being conducted without an air service license, um, then they will almost certainly investigate the circumstances um, and won't hesitate to deny a claim if they find that the operation is in fact illegal. Um, it's simply not worth taking a chance. And I think that um, any, any operator, any club, any, any flying club or any, um, um, any uh, cre club created for the purpose um, that offers introductory flights um, when in fact they're scenic flights is sailing extremely close to the wind and I would advise them not to do that without a clear, a clear waiver or clear authority from the Civil Aviation Authority to do so. Um, so we've got a couple, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, here's one from Jean-Louis Mavuba in Johannesburg who asks, why do most aircraft insurances state that pilots should have a specified number of flying hours? Jackie, can I ask you to, uh, to respond to Jean-Louis on that one? Yeah, sure. I am off mute, eh? I'm wondering yeah. if I'm on mute still. <laughs> um, Graham, actually, it's not for, um, for, an, for an insurer to choose what um, hours a pilot should or shouldn't have. Um, obviously the basis of the cover or the premium is calculated on the risk profile. So obviously if, if for a pilot that has lower hours, the insurance costs will obviously be more. And at the end of the day, it is the owner's um, choice as to what pilot he wants his, to fly on his aircraft. So if he's chosen to have a pilot with higher hours, then that is obviously the conditions that would be stated in the policy because it would fall in line with these insurance costs in that way. But if an owner, for instance, wants lower hours, it is also the insurer to for the insurer to decide whether he would accept that risk. So in some cases, the insurer may say, look, I'm not going to um, for a low time pilot to fly a specific aircraft. And then there will obviously be some negotiations in terms of what the insurer will accept and what the insured will agree to or is able to, to fit in with. So it pretty much comes down to, you know, the agreement between the two parties. Thank you. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm now gonna jump to a couple of the questions that have come in while we've been talking. Um, and, uh, uh, Sorry to um, sorry to spring this on the on the on the team. Um, Wayne Langford asks. Uh, he says you stated that the deductible is based on the value of the aircraft rather than the value of the claim. This makes sense to me, but surely there should be a set percentage value to use to calculate the deductible. In other words, twenty thousand as a deductible for a million rand aircraft seems fine, but setting a twenty thousand deductible for a hundred thousand rand aircraft is a huge percentage. Or am I misunderstanding something? Carol, over to you. Thank you, Graham. Um, in this case, um, deductibles are set to um, stop minor incidents. Um, coming through and um, insurers being inundated with very small claims. They could come in, if you don't have a deductible set, you could have numerous, um, and I mean hundreds of claims sitting at 500, um, 500 rand, 1,000 rand, 
Um, I mean, it is a stupid amount, but they could be for smaller amounts. So the insurer wants to cap um, where he wants to start paying in um, losses from and um, to, to do away with smaller ones. Otherwise, the costs are going to increase because they have to deal with all of this and they need more staff to do so. So it's just to cut out all the small, um, the small claims. And I suppose it's true to say that there's always the option of insuring that deductible anyway. Um, it's just a yep. question of arranging a separate coverage. You can reduce the 20,000 Rand deductible to you know, 2,000 Rands if, if, that's, if that's your, your risk appetite. Or to um, zero if you take the pilot excess, yeah. Or to, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, Werner, this is one for you. Marlene Reader asks, is it legal to put a siren on your helicopter for game capture? Okay, um, in all honesty, uh, that is probably another one that the CIA should be answering and not really the insurance company or your broker. Um, as I said previously, if you can get the DCA to give you sign off on that, um, it probably might be okay. Um, but it's not really up to your broker or your insurer to validate or invalidate the claim because of the siren. Uh, I, I presume that the... the, the question is really, I mean, I can imagine why a siren would would be fitted to a helicopter use of capture as, a, as an alternative to flying too low, potentially scaring mm. the, the game. Maybe you can get them to go where you want to by... by um, yes, it by, might very well be for purposes of herding the animals into a specific direction. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean... It, <laughs> Um, it, it's not really for your broker or your insurer. Um, it's probably a CIA question. Yeah, okay, fair, fair enough. Um, and let me see, I've got another one here. Um, uh, uh, Dennis, um, uh, let me have a look. Dennis asks, what is the reason insurers require to impose an excess? Um, now, this is Dennis Jankula, who started this organization 40 <laughs> odd years ago. Um, Dennis, if you've forgotten the answer, um, I'll be happy to answer separately. But I think Carol's just done that. Um, Graham, I to think cut, uh, cut out nuisance claims. Sorry to jump on that. I think I've got a, a pretty textbook answer to that one as well. Um, insurers impose an excess to basically force the clients to also take better care of their equipment and aircraft, um, or, or due care, if you can put it that way, um, because they will also take better care of it if they also suffer a financial loss and not just the insurer. True. That's a, a, a very tactful answer, yes. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and. Guys, I think from our perspective, I think we've come really to the end of our, of our session. Um, uh, one final question for uh, Daryl from Rachel Wangai in Nairobi. Good afternoon, uh, Rachel. Thank you for joining us. Um, Rachel asks, and it's probably a very good point on which to end, um, insurance premiums have been rising for the past two or three years. Will the market ever ease again? I'm happy to advise that, yes, it will. Uh, we just don't know when. The insurance market goes through insurance cycles, uh, which is the tendency to swing between profitable and unprofitable periods over time. We've been in a hard market since about 2018. So generally, the cycle starts with many competing insurers and low premiums. That's known as a soft market condition. And then after a surge in claims, uh, this leads to an exit of insurers, which results in a decline in competition and an increase in premiums. So that there is the hard market condition. After a period of time, then new insurers will enter the market, which results in an increase in competition and a decrease in premium. That's the cycle coming through into soft market conditions again. So if the assumption is correct, the cycle swing on average every five years, then rates should start to plateau within the next year, followed by reducing rates. Hopefully, we'll see if that's the truth next year or not. But the 
indications are that the cycle has reached the top and um, we should see the rating start to plateau, certainly out of the, the fees market. And uh, we may see some rate reductions as we go further and further into next year. Thank you, Darren. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think Graham, that brings I, us to... I want to just oh. uh, interrupt you because um, we mustn't forget that we have a very nice prize for... Oh, uh, right. yes, okay. So I was, I, was get, I was about to mention that, but thank oh, you. Oh, I didn't want you to forget <laughs> about it. I was, I was going to say that that brings us to the end of the questions. Now, um, there are a heap of questions that we haven't yeah. been able to get to, and, and really we do apologize for that. Um, we will try and get back to all of you um, outside of this webinar with the answers to the questions that you've raised in uh, particularly. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed it. We hope that you found it um, enlightening, informative, and, and uh, dare I say, entertaining. Um, it is something that we would like to do again if we can convince our friends with Aero SA to, uh, to, to let us take over their, their, um, their system again um, at some point in the future. If you've got any other uh, suggestions for a future webinar on the, set, on the subject of insurance, please do let us know. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to pass over to Jackie um, to let you know about our, uh, our, our lucky draw. Very important. Yeah, the questions have been really interesting, and I must say, um, it is it's refreshing to get some input from the industry as to what they want to hear, rather than us um, assuming that this is kind of just giving the same old, same old um, webinar that we do every year. So um, yes, it it's um, it was difficult to choose, um, and we have decided that the winner for our lucky prize is Wayne Langford. So I think he's actually still on the call. Yeah, Wayne. So we okay. will make contact with you and um, then you will be um, sent your prize. Thank you very much, everyone, so, for joining so us. So Wayne, 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 your, your camera and microphone are now on. We've, we've <laughs> we control it remotely. So would you mind just jumping up and down and screaming a little bit? Pretend, pretend you're, you're on, on um, Ellen DeGeneres' show. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Thanks Bye. very much.